Good evening, everyone. We are supremely grateful to have you join us for the Houston Cinema Arts Society's post-film discussion. My name is Erica Thompson, and I am the community liaison for the African American Library at the Gregory School. Before I introduce our panelists for this evening, I want to first take a moment to congratulate the Houston Cinema Arts Society on this year's incredible festival, as well as thank you all for making this beautiful event possible. One that brings together for the first time tonight's co-hosts, the Houston Cinema Arts, the Houston Museum of African American Culture, and the African American Library at the Gregory School. So by way of introduction, uh, the Houston Museum of African American Culture, or HMAC as it's officially known, is located in Houston's third ward. The museum's mission is to explore, interpret, and exhibit the material and intellectual culture of Africans and African Americans for current and future generations. HMAC seeks to be a cultural portal through which people share and converge histories and contemporary experiences that acknowledge and expand the African American experience. The African American Library at the Gregory School is one of three research centers operated by the Houston Public Library System. Located in historic Freedmanstown Fourth Ward and housed in the building that served as the first public school for free black children after emancipation, the Gregory School is an archives, library, and research center dedicated to the preservation of Houston's African-American culture. A repository of rich and dynamic histories, the Gregory School employs exhibits, programming, and an ever-expanding archive to tell the story of Black Houston's impact locally, nationally, and internationally. The 24th is inspired by one of the more significant events in Houston's history, the Camp Logan Uprising. This evening, we've convened a panel of historians and artists to discuss the film from their unique perspectives. Joining us, joining us this evening are Jefferson Pinder, Naomi Carrier, Vinod Hobson, and Angela Holder. Jefferson Pinder has produced performance-based and multidisciplinary multi work for over a decade. He received a BA in theater and MFA in mixed media from the University of Maryland and studied at the Asolo Theater Conservatory in Sarasota, Florida. Pinder's work provokes commentary about race and struggle, primarily using performance, video, neon, and found objects. He investigates identity through the most dynamic circumstances and materials. From uncanny video portraits associated with popular music to durational work that puts the black body in motion, his work examines physical conditioning that reveals an emotional response. Pinder currently serves as the Director of Academic Affairs for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion and Professor of Sculpture at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Naomi Carrier is a consummate educator, historian, performing artist, and author with a background in Black music, Texas history, and heritage tourism. She has used her gifts to educate in the public arena for 40 years through exhibits, musicals, Black history classes, workshops, and heritage tours. In 2017, Naomi completed the historical marker for United States colored troops who participated in the last battle of the Civil War in the Rio Grande Valley. She also completed restoration of the Mitchell Museum from her grandfather's historic 1913 church in Lavaca County. Naomi formerly served as executive director for the Convict Leasing and Labor Project, which seeks to memorialize the Sugar Land 95. She is currently the founder and executive director of the Texas Center for African American Living History and a professor at Houston Community College. Vinod Hobson is an artist and storyteller. His project, Those Who Desire, explores the lost, often difficult histories of the city of Houston through performance and cartography, earning Bernard the 2016 Idea Fund grant. His walking tours subvert a commercial tourist platform, the History Tour, by presenting alternative narratives that take a contemporary and critical look at canonized stories. The histories are primarily centered in and around BIPOC communities and have a resonance today often reflecting modern concerns that dominate contemporary news cycles. Well-researched and presented on the original sites, the performances become living, real-time cultural studies and critical thinking courses that ask participants to confront the past and its implications today. 
Bono firmly believes this leads to a more fully understood and appreciated concept of the city. Finally this evening, joining us is Angela Holder, a native of Baton Rouge and graduate from Louisiana State University. Angela did her graduate studies at Southern University in Baton Rouge and the University of Houston. She's taught at several universities, including Texas Southern University and Prairie View A&M University, and currently serves as a professor at Houston Community College. Angela served as president and is currently member of the board of directors of the Buffalo Soldiers National Museum and the curator of the Camp Logan Houston Riot exhibit of 1917, an exhibit that will be found at the Buffalo Soldiers Museum. Angela is a member of the College Memorial Park Cemetery Association and worked to get headstones for two soldiers buried there as a result of the Houston riot. Angela is also a proud member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority. Hi, Soror. And we are so pleased to have her join us this evening. So I know you all join me in welcoming this esteemed panel. And I now welcome and turn the evening over to Jessica Green, Artistic Director of Houston Cinema Arts Society. Jessica. So excited about this incredible um, conversation and thank you so much Erica it's been so incredible partnering with you on this program um, so you know when I discovered the 24th and knew we had the opportunity to show it in the festival it was a no-brainer I was so excited I have been looking for films like this um, that really represent you know Houston's incredible history um, we have you know as Erica shared the most incredible panel with us to discuss this history, to discuss how this history is represented in this film, right? And really get into the difference um, between the reality of this history and its representation of the 24th and just chop it up and, and learn. I'm so excited to sit back and learn from um, these folks who know this history, have studied it, have immersed themselves in it, are, are just so literate and experts in it. So it's such an incredible joy to be doing this. Um, I just want to also say, you know, this film is incredible. It's directed by the writer of Lex Klansman. It's um, and also the writer of Defy Bloods and also um, the Confederate States of America, which is a, uh, a very imaginative film in which the um, Confederacy wins the Civil War. And here we are. So I definitely recommend that. Check it out um, if you haven't seen it already. Pretty interesting film. So my job also is to introduce the incredible Bundy, um, Houston Cinema Arts Society board member and um, I guess like unofficial mayor king of Houston, I don't know. Um, and just also, you know, a founding member of EGK and currently doing incredible music and also a professor teacher at Rice University teaching hip hop religion. Uh, you're also in a retreat with Bunby moderating. He is a moderator par excellence and it's all about memory and history and uh, uh, yeah, black culture and black love and black grace and black beauty and all of it. So without further ado, Bundy, please take it away. Thank you once again, Jessica, for um, propping me up, as they say. Uh, I am so happy to have you as our director of the Houston Cinema Arts Society. Once again, you have curated an amazing festival um, with films that not only entertain, but also provoke thought and conversations like we're about to have today. Uh, I want to thank the Gregory School and HMAC for being a part of this as well. Um, I look forward to working with the Gregory School in the future, as we talked about, Erica. And um, I'm still a bit taken aback, as I told the panelists before we went live, I um, watched the film again, so I'm literally just getting away from the film as the viewers are as well. I'm still taken aback at everything that I saw. Um, I haven't been moved by a film like this since I saw 12 Years a Slave, um, and there's a kinship between these two films in terms of the protagonists of both films, Black people who have found ways to elevate themselves outside of their circumstances and still get drawn back into the discriminatory nature that this country operated in and many people would say still operate under to this day. Um, I would love to know um, just your perception of this work as people who have different entry points into this conversation and the story. Um, Naomi, I would love to start with you um, what did you think about the film? What did you take away from it? 
Well, first of all, let me give kudos to the the creators and the developers of the, of the 24th. I think this film is a very accurate depiction of the power and determination of white supremacy and racism to subordinate blacks. White's fear of genetic annihilation targets the black male, the carrier of the dominant gene that produces melanin, be it black, brown, red, or yellow skin. White skin, we know scientifically, that blonde hair and blue eyes are recessive gene traits. So white supremacy racism operates in every area of our lives, the economy, politics, education, healthcare, religion, in every institution to ensure white control over blacks. This film accurately demonstrates that and how black dominance, if you want to get down to it is revealed in say a president black uh of barack obama who had a white mother and a black father and you can see even in his face that the black gene is dominant so what this film represents to me is how the whites that are 10 percent of the earth's people who control the other 90 percent black brown red and yellow they are now still fighting for their genetic survival on planet earth this film is a reminder of how prevalent that war was in 1865, in 1917, and even in 2020. Very well said, Naomi, very well said. Uh, Jefferson, as a person who deals in showcasing Black bodies in motion, obviously we saw Black bodies in motion here in regards to them being representatives of the country only by uniform, right? Only by uniform. Uh, what did you think about the depiction of this particular incident in Houston history? Well, do you want the red pill or you want the blue pill, right? I mean, I'll, I, <laughs> I, don't, I don't think there's any going back in 2020. None of us I, can go back anyway, so. You know, um, I, I loved that the subject matter was tackled by a, you know, a well-known mainstream um, filmmaker. I think what, what excites me is that um, these stories are being noticed by different people and, and, and the connections are, are, are powerful. I think the story has to be told. I mean, that, that's one of the things I noticed um, doing my work in Houston and doing a performance piece that was about, um, you know, the Houston uprising was that a lot of people weren't familiar with the location and the landscape and where things were, that this was the location right next to Kinko's is the location of the, um, the Negro camp. Where, where these men uh, lived in tents, you know? So I think that, that what's really powerful about this film is the opportunity that it opens for other creatives to do other work about it. I mean, I think that's what excites me the most. I mean, I want young students from, from Houston to be doing work about, um, you know, the landscape and, and the people who lived there before them and, and the sacrifices that the individuals made so that, um, we could have a particular kind of luxury um, in, in the city. And so, I mean, I'm, I'm hoping that, that more creative work is gonna come of it because I think that there's a lot of nuance to this story. And I think it's almost impossible to capture in, in an hour and 45 minutes. I agree, Jefferson. I think that in the times that we live in now and this new age of black power, black empowerment that young people have uh, with regards to Black Lives Mattering, uh, with regards to the way Black bodies are being treated in terms of police brutality. I feel like any young Black creatives that see this film are going to look for similar stories like this that have not been presented to the mainstream. And I, I agree with you in terms of these stories being told by the people that they affect, right? Black stories being presented by Black people. Then obviously we've had situations where white people have tried to tell Black stories and they just don't resonate the same. Um, Vinod, as, as a storyteller, how did you feel um, the storytellers handled this situation in terms of presenting it um, as a film? I, I think they handled it, as Naomi said, it, it's really accurate. I think that if you know the history and you watch it, you recognize things. And while they took liberties with certain things, they uh, you know changed the name, the main character is kind of an amalgamation of sorts. Um, I mean, as an artistic decision, I understand that, but I think it was eerily accurate. Um, you know, you were talking, B, about um, the kind of trauma of watching the film. You know, if, if I really wanted to pick it apart, there were some things that I would say, um, 
you know, were not, not as brutal as it was. The story is actually worse than as depicted in the film, you know, so I understand sort of needing to do that, but I think it got the overall, particularly like the provocation that happened, not just from the police, that's what you expect. But one thing that I was really happy to see was the provocation from like the construction workers on the campsite and the general white population of the city, which is not something that I think is talked about enough with the story. Um, that yes, there's the history of police brutality, which is totally contemporary, but understanding that it, it really was in the entire system entire Jim Crow system, the white supremacist system in the, in the city that was uh, aligned against these soldiers. And Angela, what was your takeaway from this film? Uh, I'd love to hear your interpretation of this story. Uh, well, thank you. I'm happy to be here uh, with everyone this evening. Uh, I'm looking at the angle for which Bernard was coming from as a historian and a researcher in this topic. Uh, there were some areas that they did take creative license with, and he did mention that in the credits at the end. Uh, so if you want to get the history, um, visit the museum, the Buffalo Soldiers National Museum, you can get the history. Um, you couldn't get away from the in-your-face, total disrespect, disregard for humanity coming uh, from the atmosphere at that time. With, through the police, uh, through the civilians, uh, it was just horrible. Um, and if you look at the country, the country, it was permissible because of the Pleasant versus Ferguson case of 1896, where it legalized segregation. And there were some members of society that were overzealous in making sure that black people knew their place. And, uh, and they delighted in that. When I saw the construction worker urinating on that soldier, it was horrible. Um, and I'm thankful to Jefferson for keeping the history in his presentation. I was out there the, the summer when he was uh, doing the performance art. There was a part where uh, one of the artists stopped at the headstones of two of the soldiers that are buried there. And he sang the hymn that the soldiers say prior to their being hanged before they were dropped. My great uncle was one of those 13. And when I think about him standing on that trap door after he sang, it, it was just my father. And, and what really put it in perspective for me to see 13 young men in those coffins at the end, that was disturbing and accurate. Um, and it, it was just very moving for me. Um, but overall, yes, it, it, was, it was done, and, uh, and I'm, I'm glad that uh, the story is getting out. I'm glad it's out there. Yeah, I agree. The shot of the 13 caskets and the soldiers laying in them still, it's, I, I think that's a picture that anyone who sees this film will find very hard to remove um, from their minds. I mean, just quite frankly, I think this, this story is extremely important to Houston history. And I'm so glad that someone was able to tell this story. Um, why is this story not more known in the city of Houston? Why is this something that Houston, as a historian, uh, Angela, I'll, I'll pose this to you. Why is it that, I'll be very honest, this is my first time ever hearing about this story, hearing about the camp. And so it's all very, it's all very heavy to try to kind of parse, right? Like I'm trying to, you know, put myself in the time and the moment and everything that, that comes back, I keep coming back to this point, right? That this happened in Houston, mm -hmm. right? Well, yes, uh, Captain Matthews, uh, who's the founder of the Buffalo Soldiers National Museum, he says that Texas, while well, people associate Texas with the West, is more Southern than Western. So when you see uh, the officers making sure that those young men were not sitting in that white section of that trolley car, they, they got a pistol and they were, they were brutalized. Uh, and then too, uh, you, I don't think anybody who has a sense of decency of humanity can delight that their city was one of the epicenters of this kind of brutality. And, and the Houston that we're enjoying today being celebrated as one of the most, if not the most diverse 
city and, and the nation came out of this event. So when other cities in the South were going through their um, trials with the civil rights movement in the 1950s and all, Houston had already gone through its trial by fire, no pun intended. And so they don't want to see that anymore here, unchecked racism. You can't keep somebody down as uh, the corporal Boston said, you keep pushing somebody down, they will come up. And you don't want to see that ever again. And uh, so even though it was something bad, uh, it wasn't one of the military's brightest moments. It's an embarrassment uh, to devalue uh, human life in that form. Men who are wearing the uniform proudly representing this country. And that's how a lot of the young men escaped the oppression of Jim Crow segregation. They went and served in the military. And I never would have thought my uncle, who was on a mission looking for Pancho Villa, eating dust in Mexico, uh, he had been over in the Philippines, and he would end up at the end of a lease in Houston at home. And it's, it's kind of hard to, to, to take. It's hard, hard to understand. Jefferson, when did you find out about this story, and what compelled you to put together a performance piece around this story? Um, Vinod on this panel. Um, <laughs> yeah, we, we had a lunch, and Vinod is an incredible storyteller, and he leads these tours where... Um, he takes you through the, uh, you know, along the, the route that the soldiers traveled during that fateful evening. And uh, he inspired me. I mean, really, I mean, point, point blank, um, every once in a while, someone will tell a story so good and you're just like, I, you know, for me, it was about the location. And it still is. I mean, to, to stand up near Velvet Taco and say that this is where, you know, uh, Rufus uh, Daniels was shot. Um, it's 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 so like surreal to, to think that people aren't aware of this story in the space, and I think that was my that was the I guess the anchor of the performance piece was to go to the College Park Cemetery, just like the soldiers of the twenty fourth did, and have a moment where they realize um, what they've done and trying to figure out how to move forward. Which you know, it's I mean, I think there's something about that that's reminiscent of Native Son. You know that that there's like this moment mm -hmm. in which you take action into your own hands, and then you have to re realize that there's a consequence to that. And these men um, and these locations um, really came to terms to, to with their humanity as as far as like being a, a soldier and what they were. You know, I guess were were taught and trained how to do and and how that went awry and, and you know this that you know very fateful evening, but also all the courage and momentous. Um, uh, and heroics that happened within it. And that's what I really missed from this film was the layering of, of, of language. Like the, there are very few stories that are so well, doc matter of fact, I would go as far as say there's no uprising in American history that has been documented to the extent that this was because of the, the trial. And so when you read that, you know, that court ledger, I, I mean, it, it blows you, those stories blow you away. And, and, and somehow there's, there's no way to really be able to get at it the way I feel like, because it, it requires a certain kind of sensitivity um, and, and intimacy with, with the individuals and, and the conversations that happen that are so well documented. And so Vinod is the person that, that got me into it. And, and I'm so glad because I think this is probably one of the most powerful stories I've ever read. And when I read um, uh, A Night of, of Violence, by Robert Haynes that um, I think I know Vinod pointed me in that direction. I mean, this was written in 1977. So the story has been out there, but I, I think it's systematic. You ask, why don't you know about, you know, this? Why, as a, as a Houstonian, why didn't you know about the story? I don't think um, it's a coincidence. I think it's been systematically, um, you know, removed from history books. It, it hasn't been talked about. Um, so I guess these are the kind of things that get, got me interested in, in doing work in Houston because it is a hidden story for sure. And, and the landscape will, 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 will tell you, you know, will point you in the right direction, but without that knowledge, without people knowing what was there, it's, it's almost like it's, um, it's abstract. But no, um, since you're the, 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 the storyteller for this, um, why is it that this story isn't more well known? Um, why did it take so long for something like this to actually come into play where someone sees this story 
and feels compelled to bring it to film. I, I think that it, it's very much got to do with the very nature of Houston. I mean, I'm, I'm a, as you are, as everyone on this panel is, uh, we're living in Houston. We're great boosters of this city. We love it. Um, but you got to take the good with the bad. And this city has a, a terrible case of amnesia about so much of its past. And that amnesia comes from business usually. It's usually being sold out due to money. That's um, kind of, in my research and all the stories I tell about Houston, I almost, they almost always tie back to business. The city was founded, you know, we tell the story of the Allen brothers. That was like the, the city's first real estate scam. And it was all centered around money. And kind of every, every bit, every story that's been buried over the years is tied down to business. And so when Angela was talking about sort of, you know, it's, it's common knowledge that, uh, I mean, it's told that Houston negotiated the civil rights movement quieter than other cities in the South. And it's told that it was negotiated between the business owners um, and the media, that the media did a blackout um, when they uh, desegregated lunch counters in the city. And that is true. Um, that was a business decision to keep it quiet and to avoid unrest. And in so many ways, that was the history of, of this uprising. It was a business decision. It was a business compromise between civic leaders um, to allow the, the, the black soldiers in the city to begin with. Um, you know, it, it was the amount of money that they were getting from, from building two military outposts in the city, Camp Logan and uh, Ellington Field. Both of those came as a package deal. Um, and both of them came with the inclusion of these black soldiers. It was a civic decision. Um, and then the idea to bury it after the, the uprising, again, was all about it was all about, it was all a business decision. Civic leaders and business leaders who decided to suppress the story. Naomi, uh, seeing that there was a concerted effort to conceal this story and kind of hide it in Houston's coffers, so to speak, um, looking at where we are now in America as a country, um, how does this impact the conversation that we're having now in terms of police brutality against black people, but then also the way that rioting has been framed as something that's specifically a black thing, right? Right, in terms of, you know, we look at the protests um, specifically around George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, and there was definitely rioting there, but it's, it seems to me that it's being presented that, well, it, let me say this, I don't think that any instance where Black people have rioted in this country has come without a level of oppression against the people that are committing these acts. Do you see the parallel between the Houston riots of 1917 and, well, the Houston riot, excuse me, and what we see today in terms of people fighting against oppression and police brutality in this country? Absolutely. It is the same thing. And there is a national uh, agenda to cover up or to distort the historical memory of African Americans. The history of Houston and how it has been covered up is uh, similar, very much so, to the history of Texas. When we think of Texas as a southern state, it doesn't get the same kind of um, reputation that Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia gets. We think of Houston as this place, this is the, the gateway to the Southwest, right? But let's talk about Texas just for a minute and how this is an international place that has had six flags, by the way. So there has been continual oppression in the state of Texas, which boiled down to, let's just talk about June for a little second here. The last 
slaves to be emancipated in the South happened here in Texas, June 19, 1865. But the final battle of the Civil War was also fought in Texas, in Cameron County, very near the Rio Grande Valley. And what we're wanting now, the Texas Center of African American Living History, which is my organization that does uh, an incredible amount of, of historical reenactments in the past 20 years, we want to declare the Rio Grande River an international border because there are stories of African Americans who even uh, migrated on the Underground Railroad from Southeast Texas into Mexico. We have stories of, of, of our conquest people who ran away from slavery into Mexico. There's a whole bunch of stories over on the other side of the border, even Mexicans who helped Africans escape slavery in Texas. But the slavery that was in Texas was centered around something we call King Cotton and Queen Sugar. Those two crops were very profitable to the governments of Texas before the Civil War and after the Civil War. It was the Sugar Bowl in Brazoria, Fort Bend, of Matagorda, and Wharton County that got the state government and treasury back up on its feet through a process of convict leasing. So this story of, of this film, it, it really, one of the things that, that uh, two things that occurred to me about this story, that's how Black Death had become a spectacle in this country, whether it's football or basketball that you watch as a sport. For some reason, there is a spectacle around Black Death. It's almost like you got, what, Black bodies swinging in the southern breeze, Black boys lying in the city streets. And so when you connect what happened to uh, atone for the, the, the bravery and the courage that these men took to, 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 to defend themselves. And the fact that so many of our young men are still being defenselessly shot in the streets. So we are connecting what happened in 1917 to 2020. So you talk about the idea that the last actual battle of the Civil War was fought in Houston. I don't think that's a story that many people hear as well. Vinod, and I'll, I'll start with Vinod, but I, I, ask this, I pose this to everyone on the panel. Um, what other stories about Houston are we still waiting to see and need to be told? I think um, one that I'm really interested in that I think is better known because it's more recent, but the story of the Black Panthers in Houston. I think it's a related story I see it as a related story. It's it's two models of resistance um, to white supremacy, and both of them that were sort of snuffed out early. Um, and I think that that's a story that needs to be told. I think it's a really rich story. There's still plenty of people around who uh, were alive, but um, there's an urgency to it that uh, I think that someone needs to tell that story. So that, that's one, and I think that something else that Naomi was talking about, I think the origins of those two things, King Cotton and Queen Sugar, um, is something I'm really interested in, that they need to understand that. I think that a lot of people think about the uh, Buffalo Bayou as the main central waterway in the city of Houston, and I would argue that the Brazos River has done more and contributed more to the history of Houston and the wealth of Houston than anything else. And the Brazos is where they were growing cotton and sugar. And that's where, again, the money was made that founded this city. And as a resident of, of Sugarland, right? I live actually in Sugarland. Um, so, and not only do I live in Sugarland, I live in extremely close pro proximity to Sienna Plantation. So I live in a city named after sugar in proximity to, and keep in mind, I remember coming to this neighborhood that I live in now, probably about maybe not even 15 years ago. And the cotton, the cotton fields were still, before they tore them down and kind of, you know, started to build houses and subdivisions over here, you could drive through this part of Sugarland and see acres and acres of cotton fields. I mean, it's it's called Sienna Plantation, for that matter. 
Um, at Jefferson, I pose the same question to you, especially as a person who looks to tell these stories from a physical aspect. Is there something that you think Houston needs to know about? Is there a story that that we that needs to be told? You know, um, first of all, I think Houston is unique. I think the Buffalo Soldiers Museum is incredible, and the work that um, Dr. Holder is doing is it's. I mean, I feel like it. It's so impressive because it, to put two markers. And a cemetery for people who, you know, U.S. government probably up until like a few years ago thought were tra traitors um, is, is amazing. I don't even know the story of that. I would like to know how Dr. Holder did that, to be honest. Um, I, I also have a big question for you, Bernard, and anybody else who would know. I'm wondering why they didn't use the names in the movie. I think the names are really important. I think the names of these individuals are, shouldn't be, um, you know, you know, marginalized. Marginalized. It should be used. We should know Corporal Baltimore, not Corporal Boston. So I'm, I'm wondering if anybody knows why the names weren't used, because I think that's essential that we remember these individuals by their names. So. Absolutely, because we all know about Sam Houston, right? We know about all these different exactly. these other guys in Texas, right? Um, whose stories are we're we're raised to tell, to be told that they are you know a big part of why Texas is what it is. But I believe that the real story of Houston is still hidden. I think many parts of it, the development, the, the, the story of black people in, in Houston, the story of Mexicans in Houston, marginalized people in Houston has yet to be told. Um, I'm curious, um, Angela, how this story was passed on in your family. Oh, yes. Uh, what happened was that my great aunt had a picture of her brother, my uncle Jesse, in her house. I was a little girl, and maybe it was the shape of the frame. It was those old-fashioned opal frames. And I asked her, I said, who is that? And she said, that's my, my brother Jesse. And when you're a little kid, six years old, you ask 50 million questions. And she was so patient. And she told me that it was her brother. And that was the only time I ever saw her lovey saying it, um, that when she was talking about her brother. And she said that the army had killed him. They didn't know where he was buried. Uh, when the military executed the men, they did not return the bodies to the family. They buried them at the place of execution. Uh, the movie got it right that they were buried with a soda uh, bottle with their name typed out on a strip of paper. Uh, and so they didn't know where he was. He, was. he had written a letter, just like uh, Corporal Boston in the movie. He had written a letter to his mother. My great grandmother didn't want him to go back in. He had been there once before as a teenager. He re upped. And uh, he said, Mother, when you read this letter, I'll be in glory. She got a box with his letter, Bible, and a dollar. And uh, it just you know, tore the family apart to know that they had a sibling, a child out there in the world, and he died so horribly. Um, but this is how I learned about it. And I made up my little six year old mind that I was going to find him for her. And that became a life's work for me. Uh, it's almost like trying to buy chicken feet and, uh, because the, the facts, you know, they're just hard to, to get. There was a major fire at the per military personnel records office in the 1970s. There were some records supposedly destroyed uh, that relate to these men. Uh, you have to use muster rolls to put together some type of uh, organization as to how they lived and what they did. And uh, but this is something to where uh, I'm really dedicated to doing this. You know, and let me see if I can bounce. I'm looking at the time, and I'm bouncing what Jefferson was saying. Working with the Veterans Administration, I, I was angry that here you had two, well, yeah, three soldiers really here in Houston that are buried here as a result of the riot. One is buried over at Holy Cross Catholic Cemetery, and uh, the other two are at College Memorial Park. All the men now have one. You know, if you had a pet hamster or goldfish and you gave that little pet a funeral, you know where that pet is buried in your yard. These are human beings with no marks of remembrance whatsoever. The Houston Post of 1917, I think it was dated August 27, 1917, even wrote an article, unsung, unborn, uh, how these men were just buried. Yes, the conditions of their deaths were bad, but they still should have had some type of memorial of remembrance. And for me, being buried a hundred years in obscurity, just almost like trying to wipe them off the face of the earth, I, I couldn't.
couldn't get with that yet. So Captain Matthews were able to work with the regional office of the VA here in Houston and uh, get the necessary paperwork. You have to go through channels because we're not next of kin. So it's a process, but they were able to do this and come up with those uh, markers and those men are not obscure anymore. Uh, it's, it's, it's a shame. I'm sorry for their family members, if there are any family members for them out there, to know that their loved ones are now memorialized. Uh, so, but that was something that really disturbed me, that these men, the tragic circumstances of their deaths, that they did not have a marker. Um, my uncle, uh, he's buried at Fort Sam Houston National Cemetery. The equality that they wanted in life, they got it in death. They integrated the cemetery when they were putting that cemetery together at Fort Sam Houston. These men desegregated that cemetery. I said, wow. So yes, and there were, uh, how many men? There were uh, 30, yeah, 19 total. Out of the 19, 17 are at Fort Sam. Two other family members, uh, two families got their loved ones remains. But uh, they did have a marker. The fourth soldier who died as a result of the riot, he's buried at San Antonio National Cemetery. He was the only one of the four who died uh, that night or a couple of days later from wounds that had a marker. The other three here in Houston are 100 years, no marker. But now they have one. Uh, yeah. Amazing. Naomi, doubling back on, on the question that Jefferson posed, when you hear Angela talk about how traumatic it was for her family to know that this happened, for them to try to, you know, find this family member that they had lost, and th just the idea of Black identity, how much of a disservice do you think renaming some of these characters in this film does to the integrity of the film? I mean, it's very entertaining, it's very polarizing, but Again, there are these are real stories about real people, and we all understand that there has to be some level of dramatic license when it comes to creating films like this. But in, in terms of the identity and, and getting to the actual people who were affected by this, do you feel like this this does a bit of disservice to this to not necessarily the film because the film is has its own level of poignancy and the film drives home the point of what happened at the camp. But the idea that we don't know the real names of some of these characters. Let me just say that the name of the park where this is supposedly happened in the vicinity of is called Memorial Park. And let me just say that it is absolutely vile for their names to be memorialized. And I will connect this to my work with the Convict Leasing and Labor Project in the memorialization of the 94. Sugarland, the 95 Sugarland 95, whose DNA still has not been done. So there were 94 men. One of those persons was a woman. The youngest of those persons was believed to have been 14. The oldest was believed to have been 70. Now, why are we still covering up this story? Why did we not get invited to a memorialization ceremony? What happened in this situation? During the time that I was working with the Sugar Land 95, the meetings, the hearings, the legislative hearings, everything that happened, nothing happened to memorialize the Sugar Land 95. And I happened to have connected psychologically with some of those people. I wrote 25 stories to memorialize 25 of those individuals and their families mm. because I gave them names. That's the creative license we take as a playwright or as a theater person. I gave them names, but to say, who was Elijah, you know? Who, who, who was Lead Belly, who was a real person who was at the hellhole on the Brazos River? The only way we're going to be able to correct our historical memory is to do something that Ida B. Wells says, and that is to shine the light of truth on it. And as for Texas, and here's the story that you really don't know, is that the Brazos, Colorado River Valley was a slave empire. Uh, before the Civil War, there were as many as 55 slaves along Oyster Creek and the Brazos River that had become what your buildings with pillars, your brick quarters, 
every brick made out of the mud of the Brazos River, the sugar kettles all over the place where the women stood all day, 24 hours, 24 seven, that sugar had to be boiled. The 300,000 people that were of African descent at the end of the Civil War on Juneteenth, this is the story that we do not know that will humanize us. And one of the things that I think is most missing in the state of Texas is there is no interpretive center for the historical memory of the 300 and so Africans that were in this, it were in this state at the end of the Civil War. We have no bastion of our history. We have no interpretive center that would serve the purpose of not only telling the story, but healing the people. Wonderfully said. Um, Jefferson, as an artist, in this film, you see the character of Marie, who is a love interest for William Boston, uh, playing the piano. And when William starts to tell her stories about seeing different musicians play live in, in New York, she's totally taken aback at this. Um, I'd love to talk about the idea of Black arts, right? And Black arts specifically in Houston and how that how these things would have gotten to people in black people in Houston at that time. And was this a bit of an opening for the idea of a black art scene in Houston to start evolving? You're saying like, um, uh, what was the art scene like? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, what was the question? Well, the question is um, when you see her, it's so enamored, right? Like. Yep. For one, not just playing typical piano, but specifically, um, as soon as he brings right. up something, he she goes straight to ragtime. Um, right. Is this is this a, a representation of the black art scene at that time in Houston, and I guess nationally as well? Like, is this a way of black people telling their stories across this country through music and embracing black culture through music and art? Yeah, no, this is really. Um great that, that you, you bring this up because I think that people, um, and I think it was a really a gem of a moment in the, in the film because one, on one hand, um, you, you understand that, that the way the arts is communicated is very different now, you know, than maybe a, a song or, or like, you know, the name of, of an artist and the way they portrayed that, you know, in the film in 1917. Um, you, you know, to be honest, I am not an expert in, in Houston music in the Houston scene, but I can tell you from the art scene um, that we, we like to believe that, uh, that that this cultural heritage, you know, just came out of nowhere and, and people aren't thinking about the lineage. And um, I thought that was a great moment in the scene where you're kind of making a connection between like almost like popular music and an individual who who is a fan, but you don't know how she, um, she, she heard the songs and maybe she um, she may have read the, the sheet music and, and, and she happened to play it as well as, um, as UB Blake. So I, I just think that there were just really beautiful moments. Um, and that one was, 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 I guess, the one that, that comes to mind when you think of like, well, how, how do you, again, like reflect a, a moment in the, of the arts in, in, in a movie that's all about, you know, a horrific moment of violence um, in U.S. history. So it, it's, I think it, it, it was a nice spot. But to be honest, I don't know about the scene, um, the 1917 music scene or, or the, the, the Houston music scene for, for that matter. Yeah. I'll defer to our, our resident historians here. Naomi, you, you seem to have an entry point into this conversation. Well, that was one of my favorite scenes, not only because I'm a pianist, but because she was playing Scott Joplin, and Scott Joplin was born in East Texas. He was the ragtime queen, ragtime king. In fact, <laughs> um, his maple leaf rag sold over a million copies uh, in 1899. So that music is like native to Texas, ragtime. It's also kind of Texas, Louisiana, because it, he, it's Scott Joplin is from East, East Texas. Right, so there's obviously that connection. Beautiful. Yeah, and one of my favorite lines was uh, that he told her if he moved her to New York that he would never separate a woman from her piano. I could relate to that. No, it was, it's, it, it, this movie has so many touching moments and that still resonate with me. Um, Vinod, in terms of the presentation of this material, right? And the, the idea of, of telling this story in modern time, um, 
where does this this story fit within the the overall story of Houston? Oh, I mean, I I think. Um, let, let me say with Black Houston. Let's start yeah. there. Right. I mean, I think it's it's the the story is it it because it wasn't so well known. I think it's replayed itself uh, again and again through history. I mean, that's that's why I brought up um, you know the people People's Party too, the Black Panthers in the city. It was a similar thing. I mean, I think that there's there's again and again and again this um, I, idea of resistance um, to oppression has come up. It's risen up in Houston and then been sort of pushed down again and again and again. I keep thinking about, uh, I mean, one of the things about Camp Logan that struck me is like what a turning point this could have been. This was a sign of like black fortitude that had never been seen in the city before. Um, I mean, much less in any part of this of the South. But this this uh, symbol, this moment of black strength um, and professionalism, like these guys were incredibly skilled. Like they were really good at what they do. The film, in some ways, like it portrays so many of the soldiers as really young which is how we think of soldiers today, right? Um, but when you look at the ages of a lot of these soldiers, they were professionals who, you know, some of them had been re-upped four times, four or five times. Vida Henry, this, the first sergeant, uh, he had re-upped four times. The one, the one soldier who was kind of a local guy, this guy named Risley Young, who'd grown up in um, Galveston, uh, was, you know, 40 years old at the time. He was a 40 year old private. He fought in the Philippines. He, um, you know, these guys were like battle hardened. They were professional soldiers. They were good at what they did, and they brought a level of professionalism to what they did. Not just the calculus behind the uprising, but the way that they executed it um, showed a, a real discipline to it. And that is something that struck me about this, that these people were really good at what they were doing. They were showing off their skill and their professionalism. And there was a lot of thinking about it, which is why I resist the term riot. I think you brought it up earlier. I think riot is not the right term for this. It's a pejorative no, no. term to begin with. This was an uprising. It was a mutiny, maybe you want to call it that. But this really was in response. This was a defensive action in response to provocation. And I think the other, the other elements, whether it's the TSU riot that you're talking about or the Black Panthers, were uh, again in direct response to provocation by by white supremacists in the city. So that that's the the resonance of the uh, of the event. And I agree in terms of the use of the term riot, which I draw on that from the way it's it's presented. But I think to call that a riot is wrong. And I also think the way that they try to categorize these pro these protests and rallies in America by calling them rioters, I think it carries that same connotation. Um, Naomi, when, and I'm just gonna be very honest and open here, a lot of times when black stories are told through film, there's always this idea of the white savior in the movie, right? That kind of comes in and saves the black people from all of their discrimination and the violence perpetrated on them. I feel as if in this story, there was a concerted effort to reject that by Boston. Um, how important is it, do you think, in telling these stories, these black stories, that it is, it's important to show that black people time and time again, were not in a position to wait for white people to save them. Well, thank you very much. Um, what, one of the things that we have consistently and very much today are fighting to do, and that is to control our narrative. We have to tell our stories from our point of view. I, I can't tell your story, Bun. I haven't, had, I haven't had your experience. You haven't had my experience, but there has been a concerted effort to every time we get ready to revise history, as Blacks learn more about themselves, 
whites try to stay one step ahead and say, okay, I can tell it, I can tell it. It's even going on now with the Sugar Land 95 story. Who's going who's to control the narrative of that story? And so it continues to happen. Uh, but I'm very much against the fact that we don't understand Texas because we don't know the history. The Civil War was not over at Juneteenth. Three years later, half of the counties in Texas were headed by the Ku Klux Klan. And this went on for almost another uh, hundred years. We, then we come down to the time when the news media and the businessmen deliberately black out what's going on in North Carolina or with, with the Little Rock Nine. We, I knew nothing about that in the 60s. But we have to tell the stories of, of, of Carl Hampton. We have to tell the stories of the 24th. We cannot have our students to grow up thinking that black people did not have courage, that they laid down and took slavery, and that it's okay for us to continue calling our ancestors slaves when they were enslaved. We have to put the responsibility for enslavement where it belongs. We have to put the responsibility for oppression where it belongs. And it's just like a steam cooker. You keep cook, you keep boiling it and keep boiling it, and it is going to blow up. And that's where we are now in this war between white supremacy and 90% of colored people on this earth. And hopefully, we will be able to watch films like this together so that we can see the inhumanity in, in injustice so that we can realize that if we can be more peaceful, if we can be more tolerant of each other, this earth may be able to better serve its people with its resources. We need healing. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, I'm gonna pose one last question. And this is for anyone in the panel that wants to, to take it because they're, they're letting me know we gotta wrap up pretty soon. Cause I'm sure we could talk about this conversation more and more. This film by itself at any given time would have a certain level of adamancy and it would resonate on a certain level. I'd love to hear your opinion on the idea that this film is being presented to the public in this moment. Is that just a coincidence or do you think that this is kind of how this was supposed to play out? Because I feel as if this film would not get, and I do believe this film deserves a ton of attention. I think, again, I said it before, I think everyone needs to see this film, but I feel like right now in this moment in time that we live in, it's even more necessary that everyone see this film and understand the dynamic of black people um, in terms of their service to this country, in terms of the way that they have been treated by the police in this country, but also how their stories have, have not fully been toned and fleshed out in this, in, this, in this world, basically. I'd love to know if anyone on the panel has any, any thoughts about this story being told now and how it resonates, particularly within the black community in terms of what we're dealing with and the parallels between then and now. I mean, we're right past the hundred year mark and black people in America are still dealing um, on a certain level with the, with the treatment that people a hundred, 200, maybe up to 400 years ago were being treated. I think it's worse now uh, for the mere fact that the, the courts went against uh, the black community in 1896, Pleasant versus Ferguson, and legalized the separation of people along uh, the, a color of mine. And to have this overturned in the 1950s, uh, Brown versus Board of Education in, in Topeka, Kansas in 1954, and it progressed in the 1960s, yeah, the 1964 Civil Rights Act. So to have that oppression, that legalized oppression removed, uh, um, even though you had uh, the terrorist actions with Ku Klux Klan and all, but to say now, this is not acceptable to have had a taste of what life can be without that oppression and to go now to try to go back to that is, is this is worse. Um, to have this film to be shown now, it could be used to put things in a historical context. Um, but to, but to have had that time, the, the first black president and 
then you want somebody to just try to yank to go back. No, um, but this this film does have to be it does have to be shown. It really does have to be shown. Uh, but I really I really am concerned. It really makes me sad. I tell my students. I'm so sorry that you all are going through this right now, where people are in your face calling you the N-word. People just, uh, when we saw the, the gentleman bird watching in New York, this is before uh, the death of Mr. Floyd, how he was being accused falsely and the police could have killed him on a lie. This is the way it was hundred so years ago. But to see this perpetuated now, this institutionalized type of treatment, it's got to stop. But I, I Prime my students who are in this time that when they see something wrong, they organize, which is, this is good because we saw that mass outpouring um, with Mr. Floyd's death. And we have to maintain control of the narrative. The rioting is not caused by the, the protesters. It's outside influence that want to distract from the message. So those, are, those individuals who are in charge of getting the narrative out there, that those rights are not uh, overlooking logic. People who can rationally think, put a concise idea as to why this is happening and why it's not going to be tolerated. But to put the, the, the destruction of property in its proper place to stay on message. That's the on message. I'd like to say that I just work with the Rotary Park uh, of Herman, Herman, the Rotary Club of Herman Park to create an African American Studies curriculum, which has been passed by the Texas State Board of Education for high school students. It is imperative, it is a crisis that we teach our students about African American history and culture. It, it, without them having the knowledge to, to, to define racism, to know what white supremacy is and how it operates as a system, then they do not have the tools to combat that. Isaiah says that the people perish for a lack of vision. We are going to have to help our students to come together with the information, the truths, and the technology to learn their history so that we can have a vision and so that we can work toward more reconciliation and healing for our children who are traumatized because of the police brutality that's going on in our country today. Absolutely. Um, Vinod or Jefferson, do you have, guys have anything you want to say? Because they're letting me know we have to wind this down right now, unfortunately. Real quick, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I think this is an, a, an incredible moment. You know, we have people who have never been interested in this kind of thing who are, are now, like, for the first time, being woke. So I, I think it's great that people are learning now. And as, uh, you know, what Naomi was saying, I completely agree with this is like, this is for us. We, we really need to know this for, for us, our own sake, but I think it's great that pe other people are interested now too. Um, you know, I will say, uh, I'm not, I'm not a black person. And, um, I have, uh, thought about what my role is and I, I think that there is a role for um, a faithful ally to do what we can to uh, elevate black voices and tell their stories. And um, I, uh, as far as my, my stories go, I'm telling stories of black people and people, other people of color. If, uh, if white audiences are more willing to hear the story from me, that I'm willing to tell the story. And I think that sometimes they are, they take it from me a little easier. It's easier on their guilt that they don't have to see it from a black person. <laughs> I'm just happy to get the story out and um, they need to see it and they need to confront it. And uh, that's what I think. Well, I just want to thank everyone for joining us on this panel today. Um, it was a pleasure talking to you all, Naomi, Angela, Vino, Jefferson, Thank you guys for your time. Thank you for your insight as well as your intellect. I know I learned a lot uh, being a part of this panel and I hope everyone viewing at home learned a lot too. I also hope you enjoyed the 24th as much as I did. It's an amazing film and it's still available. Um, so the film will be available for 48 hours. So um, go and tell your friends, tell them to go to uh, cinemaacx.org. There's still time for them to go and purchase the opportunity to watch this film and learn a lot more about Houston history.
black history, uh, the history in general. Um, thank you guys so much for participating in this panel. Uh, thank you, Jessica, for putting this together. Um, on behalf of the Houston Cinema Arts Society and Houston Cinema Arts Festival, I want to thank everyone for tuning in. Have a great day and make sure you watch more films. We have a lot more engaging uh, cinema for you guys to watch. For more information and for a list of films that are still available for you to watch, please go to cinemahtx.org. Thank you all and have a great day.